Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland. This is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. What are you doing? Vinny's trying to get treats out of my pocket. Bless him. There you go, they're in there. Look at that. So, um, beep, 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 beep. I do have a YouTube channel, which you can... Well, we've got links from my website there, but you can just search for me. First search for my name. There's a few videos on there. Um... I have a Facebook group called Jason Newland's Boring Group. Had about three new people join since yesterday's recording, so welcome. In fact, I'm going to say your names. Only the first names, of course. I have to check it out. What is it? Or is it two? No, I had, I had 132 members yesterday. Now I've got 135. So, I just want to say welcome to Mike. No, not Mike. Welcome to Nicole. Welcome to Mary, Mary Jo. I might have pronounced that incorrectly. Incorrectly, but it's Mary Jo, M A R Y J O, and thirdly, Matthew. So, welcome, 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 welcome. Uh, so Jason Newland's boring group. If you're a regular listener of my podcasts then you're welcome to join it's a private group but just ask to join and you'll be accepted it's just a it's, it's kind of one of those facebook groups it's not you know there's, there's a lot of facebook group there's, there's a lot of facebook groups that i've joined and i've had no activity on there in the past i've joined to kind of promote my stuff or whatever uh, it's not that kind of group. It's just, it's a place only for people who are actively listening or watching the videos. And that's what it's there for. So you can get to know other people. Maybe you can get to, you know, leave me messages or let me know what questions you have for Q&A Friday. Which brings me to the next thing. Q&A Friday is tomorrow. So it's Thursday today. So if you have any questions for Q&A Friday, please go onto the group on Facebook and uh, leave me a question. Alternatively, you could go to my website, jasonnewland.com, and you could uh, send me a message on there with a question. I've got, I think, about three questions already. But I generally... It's good to have it's good to have a few more, if possible. So, or you can send me a, a message on Facebook if you want. Yeah, it's up to you. Yes, it is, isn't it, Vin Vin? Yes, it is. So yeah, um, today I have mainly been. Working on what I doing doing today. Working on a website. I'm now for the Let Me Bore You to Sleep recordings that you can download. I've now got up to about one hundred, no, one thousand one hundred and one, I think. So we're getting there. It was one thousand and eighty yesterday. So it takes a while because they're big files, as it you know they're uh, some of them are a few gigabytes because it's all four, all four um, 
versions of the recording, you know, without music, with music, five hours and ten hours on the, the later ones. So I'm also been uh, working on the Spreaker podcast, uploading stuff on there. It's a very slow process, as well as making new videos for my YouTube channel. So I've now uploaded up to 210, the Let Me Boy to Sleep, number 210. Uh, I'm not sure, if, I don't think I've actually released them yet. But they've been uploaded, so I'll release them later. I'm also in the process of testing out a new video software online called CapCut. So I've got a seven day free trial. And the reason I'm looking to use that is because at the moment, what are you doing? He's, he's just fidgeting. Just lay down. Just lay down, Finn. I have got to fidget all the time. The yeah, I use Canva for on my laptop. I use Canva to make videos at the moment for YouTube, and that's just like an image and then the audio, you know, just to create a video. But there is a limit of two hours on Canva. So I can't do the five hour or the ten hour ones. And I'm planning from now on. What are you doing? And I just realised. Yeah, it's got to be ten hours without music. Five hours without music, ten hours, yeah. I just realized, yeah, so I did the five hours. So basically, going back, all I've done is a bit of research to find out which is the most suitable video editing software that I can use online. I mean, there's one called, oh, is it DaVinci or DaVinci, I think where you pay like $300 and it's a one-off payment and then you download the software to your laptop and I think you can also use it on Apple as well but I think it's best used on a laptop and then it's got all these really great things you can do on it but the other, there was like I, I looked at reviews and CapCut and I don't know what you're doing, Vinny. He's literally, he's on the chair. He's on the, the, the settee with me, to the left of me. And he's he's on the armrest and he keeps moving around. I think he's he's trying to find a way to get comfortable. Is that what you're doing, Vin? Trying to get a way to come. Do you want me just to leave you alone so you can get comfortable? Hey? Eh? <laughs> so, I looked at Da Vinci. I, I might have the wrong name. I think it's Da Vinci. I didn't. Re I thought it'd be like a monthly payment, like a lot of things are, but it's no, you know, three hundred dollars. That was a that was a no no straight away. Um, I actually set up a free account on there and went to upload stuff, and I said, "No, you can't upload anything." What do you mean? I want to upload audio to turn it into a video. No, you can't do that. You have to, and it just the free version wasn't really much good. To me but so what I did is I looked at CapCut and I'm using that and I've just made my first video uh, it's basically yesterday's recording but the five hour version and everything I do has to be without music that I upload on YouTube so it's the five hour version without music also, I've taught her to change the image so it's five hours and then black screen. So I've got an image, uh, a logo saying black screen. So after the first 10 seconds, it goes to a black screen. So anybody watching on TV or watching on a computer or on their phone or whatever, they no longer have that shining light 
you know, of the computer screen or the, the phone or the... I mean, to be fair, you could probably just put your phone face down. That'd probably be a, a solution, perhaps. I don't know. I'm not sure if... Yeah, I'm not sure. But with the TV, that'd definitely be good because it'd just go to a black screen for five hours. So that's that's what I've done. I've actually... It took a while to process. I was kind of surprised at how long it took. Probably maybe up to an hour to process a five hour. Maybe a little bit less, but perhaps about an hour. So the 10 hour one, I'm going to be doubling that. That's a long time. I'm not going to be able to produce too many videos in a day using CapCut. Hmm. But it's okay. I'll just see how it turns out. It's all, it's all experimental, really. It's just testing things, seeing what works, what works best. Uh, I need things that are easy, easy to use, really. Because I'm not looking to do anything particularly high-tech. Especially at the moment with just having a static image uh, I might you know when I do maybe some future hypnosis stuff I'm perhaps going to have more animation spirals and stuff like I've had before but then mm, I don't know I'm just I'm just playing around with the ideas at the moment I don't mind I don't mind playing around and even if I don't get a huge amount done. As long as I get something done. And if I get a recording completed, even if it's not uploaded, if it's at least recorded, then the day is being fruitful, kind of, you know? So I've not made a huge amount of, create a huge amount of um, new recordings to upload to Spreaker. Because I'm making longer versions of old recordings, but five hour long and ten hour long without music. Which is taking, it's quite time consuming. It's, yeah, it's going to take months, <laughs> to be fair. But it's okay, I don't mind. Just see something on the floor. So he's asleep now, or he's lying down on the half on me and half on the armrest to the left of the settee. Now, he doesn't normally do that when I'm on the other side. He doesn't, doesn't really, he rarely gets onto the the armrest I'm not sure why maybe because there's a little table next to it this is nice because he can just lean over it and there's nothing there I'm just stroking his back and he seems quite happy yeah so yeah there's, there's not a lot really happening today I've got a neighbour coming round tomorrow. I don't know if I mentioned this. I might have mentioned it yesterday. Basically, her little girl. So she's coming round with her daughter, and I've known I've known the little the little girl since she was born, before she was born, because she was the neighbour was pregnant with her when I moved in, and she she was going to go and see Matilda the musical in London, in the theatre. But it got cancelled. Uh, I don't know. The the trip got cancelled or they cancelled it. I'm not sure. But anyway, the, the event, they, they didn't go. And they came round the other day. And I thought, oh, okay. So I thought, I'll have a look. Because I already looked online to see if there was a version I couldn't see it in London, to be fair. I tried to look for it in London, but it didn't seem to be anywhere. 
So maybe it's not on there no more. This is a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. But there's Matilda, the on Netflix, it's a musical. Which is not the original Matilda movie, but it's the musical version, which was, I don't know, a year or two ago. Now, I don't know whether or not it is... If, if it's filmed live or it, but to be fair, I don't think it was filmed live, but it's, it's still a musical. So I just assumed that Matilda was originally a musical, but I guess it wasn't. But I found it on Netflix, Matilda musical, musical. Okay, London Theatre Direct. So that's a stage, but you can. Matilda the Musical. Tickets, tickets. Oh, but on Netflix, watch Roald, Ronald Dahl's Matilda the Musical. It's got Emma Thompson. And yes, yeah, so it's not. It's not actually live. As as it were, if you know what I mean, it's not the. It's not from a live stage, so like as if you was in the audience, but. It is still. The closest thing she's gonna get, I guess. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Is the new Matilda, on Netflix. Yes, Minchin had to do it, might do, but it might sense one of the reasons sounds good. Minchin added that the deal between Sony and Netflix might be disappointing, but it makes sense and is one of the reasons the film is so good. Matilda the Musical is now available to watch on Netflix. Okay. Is it? Yeah, only Netflix. Not on. It's not on Disney Plus. Uh. Or you can rent or purchase it on Google Play Movies, Apple TV, and Fandango. Whatever the heck that is. I don't know what Fandango is, do you? Do the Fandango. I mean, I don't, what is what is it? Isn't it a cocktail or something? Oh, I remember years ago, or oh, when I used to be in the comedy club with that had a bar and it was a nightclub and everything. And people used to come up and ask for cocktails. And the names of the cocktails were rude. But they were real cocktails. But they kind of like... Uh, like, uh, like Slippery Nipple. Or Sex on the Beach. Or... Uh, um. No, I can't remember. A bum job. No, not a bum job, that wasn't it. Um, I'm sure there was another one. Um, yeah, another one. A blow or something. It's just like, but they're actually, they're actually real cocktail names. Let me just have a look, because I need to remind myself. I don't want to be saying stuff that's not true. Um, naughty. Naughty cock. Tail names. Right. Ed, what? Crazy and funny drink names. Okay, I'm not reading that one out because that is rude. Yeah, the blow. Yeah, that is definitely one. I thought so. Can I have a whatever? Like, um, duck fart. <laughs> <laughs> that suits me better. Just because I'm a child, obviously. Pink Panty Dropper. Blimey. These are real names, by the way, for drinks. Pink Panty Dropper. What's number one, then? Adios Mother... Tickler Cocktail. Uh, pink panty, liquid 
Marrow, okay, drink shot. But that might actually be really, be, oh, I don't know. Duck fart. <laughs> oh dear, that, that, that appeals to me. Duck, f it, I looked at the drink, it looks okay. Not sure about the, the bottom bit, but yeah. Below, okay, so there's a one something job shot. Uh, Red-headed slut shot. Wow. Blimey, that one's like a medical thing. I don't want to write. I don't want to read that one out. Liquid coke, coke shot. Not really coke but you know. Chuck Norris shot. Wow. I just imagine that's a very powerful one. Named after the infamous action hero, hero, this unexpected Chuck Norris shot is sweet, spicy, and packs a punch. Uh, yeah, buttery nipple cocktail. That might be the same. It might, maybe that's in America, but in England, it used to one be called the slippery nipple. And um, I don't know, that used to make me laugh. Porn star shooter. Uh, uh, oh, slippery nipple cocktail. Yep. Oh, that's it. Yeah, another video. S Irish Irish cream on top of sambuca with grenadine. Gren grenadine sinking below. Okay. I don't really know why it's called that though. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I'm <laughs> just seeing the visual. Maybe that's it. Slap your mama cocktail. What? Big O cocktail. I don't know why that's rude. G, G spot cocktail. Um, then there's the A spot, B spot, C spot. Now this is something. This is one that I thought, why would you even drink this one? Just the name of it. Okay, the first word begins with S. Ends in T. And then on the grass shot. S H I T on the grass shot. Make you poo on the grass shot. How how is that appealing? There's another one. Blood. Oh no. Sex on the beach. I mean that's mild compared to some of the others now. Blue ball. <laughs> Blue balls shot. Now not everyone's going to know what that. What <laughs> last time I had <laughs> the equivalent to that drink? Oh man, yeah. So let me see what it says about the comedy club because it might still be information on there. You don't know, it's possible. One of London and UK's best loved and young and longest standing comedy clubs based in a hard East End. It's still up. It's not there, hasn't been there for years. Even got the telephone number. Wow. Hasn't been there for years and years and years. Blimey. What was that one then? Production book comedy 1999. What is that? Comedy cat. Right, okay. Um, it's a TV show apparently, but I don't remember that. I would have remembered that, surely. <sighs> nope, that's it. I bet you though. Okay, Shoreditch Comedy Club. Here we go. Skyrocketing. This is from... Boom, 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 boom. December, 9th of December 2016. Eight years ago nearly. Skyrocketing rents means that the club 
has helped the club that has helped big names learn their craft can't afford to stay open. Uh, a comedy club that helped to launch the career of Jimmy Carr, Eddie Izzard, Simon Amstel, Joe Brand has been forced out of business because of rising rents. Um, it's closing its doors to the public after 26 years following a party on New Year's Eve. He's the owner said that a near doubling of rent from 120,000 to 230,000 a year, just the rent, 120,000 put up to 230,000 a year made it impossible to continue in the present location. It's uh, he told the stand, yeah, he told the standard. It's devastating. It's like your girlfriend's left you and you see her walking around town with another guy. It's because someone else has now got it. Although they didn't use it as a comedy club anymore. When we opened here, people thought we were insane. There was nothing but printing presses and uh, street stuff going on. Shoreditch became an area for artists and rent went up. Then the IT crowd came in and rents skyrocketed. Now... It'll become just another overpriced bar for Shoreditch people. <laughs> That's not the word they used. With their big beards and skinny jeans who think they, they're too cool for comedy. Um, looking for new premises. Jude rise in business. So also business rates as well. So it's not just the rent. Faces huge rights. Um... So that area had the biggest rise in business rates. Blimey. So it looks like I'm going to talk about the comedy club again. I've talked about it enough, haven't I? But hey, I'm going to talk about it again. I had that particular comedy cafe. Now, I've, I've talked about it, but I thought I'd just... Thinking about the, what are my memories of that place? I've got so many memories. That was my favourite comedy club out of all of them. I loved the comedy store. There was a lot of really, really, really lovely comedy clubs. Um, most of them were just rooms in pubs or a room behind a pub, like a big room or, you know, a, a function room which held a few hundred people. There wasn't many purposely built or comedy clubs that were just comedy clubs and nothing else. And a comedy store pretty much was the first one. And then you had Jonglers. There was the Comedy Cafe... I think that was there before Jonglers. I might be wrong. I think it was a comedy store, then Jonglers. No, comedy store, then the comedy cafe, then Jonglers. Because they started building comedy clubs around the country, I think. And then the Backyard Comedy Club was built by Lee Hurst in about 99, 2000 time-ish. And it was just up the road. <laughs> so uh, my friend wasn't uh, hugely impressed with that. Because Lee Hurst was famous. He was on a TV show. Was it They Think It's All Over? But it, They Think It's All Over. I think it was the name of the show. Really popular. And he was one of the team captains. And he became proper famous. Very wealthy. And he's a nice but I really liked him actually. But I think my and he was friends of he was friends of my friend as well, who owned the club here. But he he didn't he wasn't I don't think he was like hugely happy that someone was building a comedy club around the corner. It wasn't literally around the corner, but it wasn't far away. You know, really wasn't that far from where we was or where in Shoreditch. 
but he'd come in. The thing about Lee Hurst is, I don't know why, but he always remembered my name. He was like, oh, Mr. Jason Newland. Well, I don't mean, he just, so, all right, Jay, or Jace, or Jason, or whatever. It's like, wow. And I was taken back because I just remembered it's a chip van, chip van night, which uh, means that Vinny will be barking a bit because the neighbour opposite goes down there, but he comes out, he comes out a few times, waiting for the chip van to arrive. It takes him a little while to get down the stairs, so I'm not, you know, it's not an issue. I don't care. I don't hear him. Vinny hears him. He, I don't hear him at all. He comes in and out of his front door so quietly, but Vinny hears everything, and he barks. Also because he likes him. So he's excited. He wants to go and say hello. So that's one of the things I've got with the neighbours. Because everyone's... Uh, most of the neighbours... Like... Uh, give him a lot of attention. One downstairs says hello. But she's never really been particularly bothered. And she says hello. But she doesn't like go gushy gushy for him. But... Another neighbour downstairs goes really gushy for him, like proper. He's, I think he's in love with her. And then the other one's really nice to her, but I don't, not nice to him, but I don't see her very often. And another bloke who on the top landing, he he doesn't really give much attention to, to Vinny. I don't think he's really a dog person, but he's nice to me, so <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> He's not horrible to Vinny, just he's not that interested, you know. So, yeah, Lee Hurst, he came in. I want to tell you one of his jokes. I'm not going to tell you. It's, I remember seeing him. So he was a headliner. Early 90s, he was already a headliner. But I saw him doing like a... A ten-minute spot at the op at the comedy store, which is like you do an open spot, which is free. Now I'm going back, so I don't know what the rules are now. That's how everything used to be. So you do. I mean, okay. Once you get to a level, you don't do open spots anymore, especially if you've got your own management. Then. Then I guess you'd you know you'd be put into you don't have to audition for every single gig you do, but you you kind of do to start with. Um, what you what used to happen, not for me but for other comedians, promoters would turn up at these open nights, the new act nights where you get new comedians. There'd be three three different types of people come in three types of comedians there'd be I was two of them two of those types and I wasn't the third <laughs> so the, the, the first type I say the third type for the third type first so the third type is established comedians just trying out new material that's it so you get um, like Lee Evans turning up or um, Harry Hill or I'm just trying to think of the big names at the time back then it's quite a while but you know you'd get like well known even TV people that you see on TV turning up at a, quite a small gig because they just want to test out their new material and they might be normally performing in theatres you know to two two thousand people three thousand people so you know so you get those people or just headliners who earn a living doing it but they want to try out new material rather than try it out on a saturday night when they're getting paid good money so they'll just go in go on stage for five minutes 
couple of ten minutes. They can, they can kind of do what they want, really. You know, if... Uh, I'm pretty sure if Jimmy Carr or any of the, you know, the current famous comedians or Ricky Gervais uh, turned up at an open night, a new act night, and said, can I go on stage? I'd like to do an hour. There isn't a promoter on the planet that would say no. <laughs> Is there? Let's face it. And there's no audience would, that would say no either. In fact, there'd be no comedian that would say no because they'd be so probably excited to, to see and probably meet Ricky Gervais or Lee Evans. I know he's, Lee Evans is retired now, but or Harry Hill, or um, there's so many. Uh, for me, my favourite is Stuart Lee. So there's those, you know, where you get... I've actually seen, I remember I watched this documentary about the comedy store in America, and they did it first. I think they started a couple of years before the London one. And Paulie Shaw's mum, is it Missy? I think it was Missy, Missy Shaw. But Paulie's, Paulie Shaw's mum was the owner of the comedy store. So Paulie Shaw was born into comedy. He was, he grew up, grew up around famous comedians so you know if you might if you don't know who Paulie Shaw is just google I guess I don't know I'm not sure did he take over the comedy store from his mum because his mum his mum did pass away but I've seen famous comedians who who said that they they were all getting really excited they managed to get a slot at the comedy store in America and finally like an American like a big film star it might have been Kevin Kevin whatever his name is but he said he was standing there ready to go on and he was just going to do a short spot and it was going to be free he wasn't going to get paid but if it went well then he could get paid work you know and suddenly he heard someone shout so whispering uh, Robin Williams is here and he wants to go on stage and try some new stuff out. So Robin Williams went on and took over the night. So there was no more comedians on that night. Because no one's going to say no to that. <laughs> no, we don't want to. We don't want to. Um, <laughs> one of the fam most famous comedians in the world going on stage. Of course not. You. We want the new people. So... But it might have been Chris Rock or someone like that. But it's like it didn't it didn't affect his career. It did it really, let's face it. He still went on to be a huge star himself. It might not have been Chris Rock, but it was someone of that calibre, someone of that kind of level of fame. And he got kaplunked. Is it kaplunked? What do they call it when you go to buy a house, but you have to have your house sold? So you think your house is being sold, then you put an offer in for another house, but then your house, the person that's buying your house doesn't, and therefore you're unable to buy that house. There's a, like a break in the chain. Is it Kaplunk? Monopoly? Frustration, definitely frustrating. Kapunked, labunked, badunked. The bunk, but but the plunk, bunk, jump, bunked, monk, monk, monk. I don't know, something like that. So that would that would happen, and it would happen. I tell you something though, it's quite ironic because you'd have both sides. So you'd have a headliner at the comedy club, and people would turn up and ask to go on. So you get like a like on a normal night, even. Harry Hill might turn up and say, can I just, I want to just do 10 minutes. Can I do 10 minutes? I just want to try some stuff out. And the answer is always going to be yes, isn't it? Always. Like, it's never going to be no. Um, so, and that was cool. 
But what I noticed is those comedians that were up and coming, that were trying to move into television, would basically cancel at the last minute. So they'd have they'd be the headliner to perform at the comedy club that I was where I was on a Friday and Saturday night and their management would call up would call up maybe in the afternoon or even early evening to say oh we can't make it he's got a TV offer to go on a TV panel show or something like that so that it's my boss my friend would have to phone around to find one of the comedians that's doing gigs locally to see if they can come up and you know finish the, the night uh, if, you know do the last uh, the last slot of the night is and it would happen so often there was one particular comedian that would do it I feel I better not say their name because it's true but I don't want to get sued because it, it wasn't their fault it was just they were a brilliant, brilliant comedian, and now they move their films in loads of movies and stuff. Just very, very, really funny. But anyway, this person just more and more was cancelling to the point where my friend just like, now nah, I'm not booking them anymore. Just like it's no point, and they weren't at the level of being famous at that point. So they, this person hadn't, they weren't, they weren't known publicly like nationwide. I'd say they probably are now. Maybe not as a comedian, probably more as an actor. I'd say. But really, been in some huge movies, and um, but this person was like so funny. I used to look forward. I used to get so disappointed when they didn't come, because I used to love seeing him, or her. See? See what I did? Huh? 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 I remember once I went to the comedy store and Linda Smith, who was supposed to be headlining, um, she was she was one of the top comedians, but she 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 cancelled because she'd lost she couldn't find her eye contact or contact lens for her eye. And they they the the compare came on and just spent about twenty minutes making fun of her. <laughs> for not for cancelling because of something as silly as that um, I don't know if it's a silly excuse or not I've got no I've never worn contacts and I mean it depends where she lost it I guess you know I guess uh, I imagine people with contacts would still have glasses but yeah I remember Joe Brand. See, Joe Brand was the first famous person I ever met in the comedy world. And she was proper down to earth. Like, really, there was no... No sense of her being famous at all. She was just sitting around. She used to, they used to have chairs near the bar. And there's a fireplace. And she'd, like, sit down and... It didn't it didn't have a problem with talking didn't didn't care who she talked to it's, you know there was a comedy comics room upstairs where the comics could go especially if they were performing but she 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 didn't used to perform there she was already doing th you know, theaters and stuff she was famous well before I mean, she was famous in the 80s the late 80s so she used to be on like Friday Night Live with um, who did Friday Night Live oh Ben Elton Ben Elton that's it so that was what 88 86 87 88 well I was super excited to meet her but I don't know what I said I might have said something well I said something that upset her and she never spoke to me again. And she let me know it upset her. But I didn't know what it was. She even told me. But I couldn't understand why she was upset. 
and I might have been just trying to make her laugh I don't know the weird thing about it is I got on really well with her boyfriend he didn't seem to be bothered because I always got on well with him really and he was he was a boyfriend and then he he, he was a really good comedian and he used to write comedy as well so I got on with him I'm talking right the way for like I knew him for about 10 years probably and Jim McCarb was it Jim no Jim McCarbra something like that he was such a nice bloke he used to have like uh, when I first met him he used to have like a teddy boy hairstyle but he's very funny and I remember seeing him and him just he still always used to chat to me just like say hello and just have a chat it was no there was no bells and whistles with him you know he was just nice a nice bloke and he forgave me for whatever I said to Joe Brand I don't I don't know what it was I said and I didn't mean to upset her because I was in awe of being a, being near her because I'd never I'd never really spoken to a famous person before so yeah I mean she is if you're in another country you might not know who she is but really she's one of the the longest running not just female comedians but comedians stand up comedians she's one of the first original alternative stand ups like in the country but I'm like you know from London from the comedy store kind of era um Yeah, wow. I don't know. If she still tours. I, I know she's wrote. She's written some books. She's been in TV shows and stuff like that. But she's you know well known in this country still. I would say. I don't know how active she is. She might have retired to be honest, because I'm guessing she's probably a fair bit older than me, and I'm old. She may well have retired by now. Mind you, she might not be that much older than me. Maybe 10 years, I'd say. I might be wrong. Let me have a look. Just look. Joe Brand. Joe Brand. She's 67. So, yeah, she's definitely retirement age. Whether or not she's retired, I don't know. But, so she was 67. 57, 47, 37. <laughs> she was about 34. 34, 33, 34 when I met her. Crazy, crazy times. It goes so quicker, Lee. Huh. But anyway, I remember seeing the, her, the, the, the bloke that used to write for her and he used to, I think he used to write for her, but... He used to write comedy for people and he also used to perform and I think at one point he was dating Joe a long time ago. And at this point I think I was more involved with the comedy club like at the weekends. And we were just chatting. It might have been a party. It might have been a comedy party or something. A birthday party or just a something, you know, where all the comedians got together. And... At that stage, I wasn't really part... I was part of the comedy scene, but just as a... in connection with the comedy club, not really in connection with being a comedian, but... or wannabe comedian. So, I... I remember him coming up to me, and we were just chatting, and he said, I'm quitting. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm quitting comedy. I said, no, I didn't believe him because it was really, really good. It was really funny and I liked him as well. But that's not really relevant to him quitting or not. But it's like, why would you quit when you... Just knowing... 
I, I just couldn't understand why someone that had talent, comedic talent, that I would have at that point probably sold, I, I, I'd have given anything for, to be able, just to have like 5% of what he had, because I could have been a successful comedian. You know, just 5% of the talent he had, I could have earned money from being a comedian. But, um, and he said something I've never ever heard anyone ever say before. Um, he said, uh, <laughs> and I thought, no, he said, he said to me, I said, why are you quitting? Why would you mean you're quitting? He said, I'm not doing it anymore. I said, why? He said, because I'm never going to be the best. I said, what? He said, I'm never going to be the best, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it anymore because I'll never be the best. But And I said, I, I kind of tried to talk him out of it, which is weird. Um, because, you know, I didn't have any sway over his or anyone else's choices in their life at that time or at any time, really. But like, what do you mean? You you don't, you, you, because you will never be the best. I said, but you're a brilliant comedian. You're a brilliant writer. You're successful. You've got everything going for you. And, and there is no best. It's not, it's like, who's the best footballer? There is no best footballer. You can say, well, you know, it's Rihanna, whatever his name is, or, um, you know, the other one, and you know, whatever, I don't really follow football. Pele and Keegan or whatever, George Best. Good name for him. Um but I'm going back like 50 years, so maybe I should look at some more up-to-date names. Paul Gascoigne, he was good. He was brilliant. Uh, but, you know, it's like, even in boxing, there's no best. Because everyone keeps, even if someone wins all of the belts in a division, a weight division, they usually end up getting beaten. Or they retire unbeaten, which is rare. It happens sometimes. So they they retire, but even while they were champion, doesn't mean that they were best because they didn't fight everyone. They'd have to fight everyone in order to prove that they were the best. And they never do fight everyone. And you could argue, oh yeah, but we fought all the top contenders. But not all the up and coming. There's Because you think about it, Mike, I'm trying to think. So someone like Mayweather, when he was 20, there, there were world title champions, world champions that he could have beaten, but he wasn't in their weight division. He probably still could have beaten them if he'd gone up in weight, but maybe he wasn't able to because he wasn't quite, you know, big enough to do that. He wasn't, or he didn't have the the popularity or the sway to get those big fights because he was starting out. But he was brilliant. Sugar Ray Leonard, brilliant. But Sugar Ray Leonard had a much bigger profile because he was Olympic champion. Olympic gold champion. It's weird though, isn't it? You think um, Classius Clay winning the gold in the Olympics. Vinny? Okay, what? Muhammad Ali. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm using St. Cassius Clay because that was his name at the time, right? So, Ka Vinny, calm yourself down. Otherwise, me and you are going to have a big long conversation over some noodles. And not over noodles, that's one of his friends called noodles. <laughs> <laughs> I threw him hot. I, he said, what are you having for dinner today, Dad? I said, I'm going to have noodles. He screamed, no, not noodles. 
I said, no, no, no. I'm going to have a pack of noodles in the microwave. No, not in the microwave. I love noodles. And uh, it's like trying to get... So I don't say the word noodles anymore when it comes to eating. So, um, yeah. So he was Cassius Clay. He won the gold medal. He came back to America because I think it was in Seoul, the Olympics. And it's weird that I would remember that. Why would I remember that? Why would I remember that? Seoul Olympics... I'm just going to check. Rome. It was Rome. The Rome Olympics. Good boy. Stop with a barking, please, mate. Good boy. So, it was Rome. 1960 Rome Olympics. Where Cassius Clay won the gold medal in the light heavyweight division. Now... Back then, light heavyweight. Yeah, it was different because now you got heavyweight and super heavyweight in the Olympics. So the, I guess you still got light heavyweight, but basically what the heavyweight now is cruiserweight. So if someone, if you win the heavyweight, um, Olympic gold and then you become professional you generally be will be a cruiserweight as a professional although put a few pounds on you can fight as heavyweight but if you win the super heavyweight gold in the Olympics or medal in the Olympics that means you when you turn professional be pro, you'll be a heavyweight it's weird I don't know why they don't just have the same I don't know why they have so many different weight classes to be honest with you I mean, why don't they just have a super heavyweight for the really big guys? So anyone over... I don't know. So just have like... like maybe that will be the next thing. Maybe that will be the next thing. They'll have a super heavyweight because there'll be a way of making some money. So Tyson Fury can then go into and win a world title at a different weight another weight because he's limited to just one weight class because he's so big ah but anyway Cassius Clay as he was back then he came he didn't come home to a hero's welcome he as far as I'm aware and he Let's have a quick look. Why did... And this is what happened, yeah? Okay. According to the commonly told story, he was 18 years old. So Muhammad Ali, 18. And still going by the name of Cassius Clay. He tossed the medal he won at the as a boxer. So he tossed his gold medal for the 1960 60 Summer's Olympics in, disgu in disgust if I can learn to read if my eyesight read I'm struggling to see the words after Louis Louisville restaurant um, discriminated against him by denying him service wow it's just yeah I mean now if you win a gold medal you're a hero. Whatever country you're from, you're a hero. Like, and he wasn't classed as a hero. He was 18 year old. I mean, blimey. But hey, then he went on to be, some would argue, quite successful. <laughs> quite successful. Why am I talking about Muhammad Ali? I don't, got no idea. Olympic gold medals for some reason how do we get from Joe Brand to Muhammad Ali there's got to be a way we did it some kind of weird canoe ride that got us there but I remember saying to Jim because that wasn't his real name, name either 
let's have a look what his real name was I think it was Paul or John Jim Jim Miller okay so comic Jim Miller aka James McCarb so he passed away 2018 fellow stand-ups pay tribute um, to, to a former circuit manager I uh, saw former circuit comedian Jim Miller so he always used to win his um, Jim Macabre he started off as a punk musician but became active as stand up in the London clubs in the 80s and 90s performing a deadpan act under the stage name James Macabre he was one of the founders of the Meccano Club in Islington. I did not know that. Initially in the Camden Head pub where the likes of Eddie Izzard, Phil Jupitus, Matt Lucas, Joe Brand and Harry Hill plied their trade. Miller dated Brand for a while and co-wrote with her. See? I wasn't reading this off when I told you. This is just my memory. I'm reading this now, but that was my memory. I'm glad it's true because otherwise... It's what I remember it's from a long time ago. Uh, he dated Brand for a while and co-wrote with her, including her heart, her breakthrough Channel Four series through the Cake Hole. Miller's his sister confirmed he passed away on Facebook after James Pennett of the Bearcat Comedy Club broke the news. Um, okay. Fellow comics also took to social media to pay tribute. David Baddiel said he was weird and funny and very much like the very much the kind of thing comedy produced below the mainstream radar back in the day. Andre Vincent posted a message to Miller saying, You're one of my inspiration and close friends, incredibly intelligent, superbly funny, ugly drunk, great cook and scarf collector. And Mark Mayer said it was horrible new horrible horribly sad news brian higgins said he was a lovely lovely human phil nickel told him safe travels to where it is we go so this was 21st of october 2018 oh. i just i just found that it, it touched me when he said that to me though like I'm never going to be the best how how did he come to that I mean in 2018 he was 58 so he was probably again I don't know try and work that out born in 1960 I guess because I was 48 in 90, 2018, yeah. So he was born in 1960. Susan is probably, last time I spoke to him, he's probably nearly 40. Maybe 40. So he wasn't, wasn't old. I mean, if you look at, see, I want to tell you a story, and how would I know this? But I do. And I'm going to read it again. I'm going to check it on Google to make sure I've got it correct. Okay. The reason I, oh, I'm just getting nostalgic now. I want to do comedy again. <gasps> I want to go back on stage. <gasps> but I'm too old now. Too old. Too old. You know, I was the youngest. Well, I wasn't. Not forever, but I was the youngest when I started um, doing comedy. I was the youngest person on the circuit. I was 20 years old. However, um, I think it's Simon Anstel, but he used to turn up and he was about 14. <laughs> and he used to come along and he wasn't allowed to perform, but he was allowed to sort of stay and watch the show. And it, I don't know if it was him, but it was definitely... It was a kid that used to come along to the Wednesday nights and he was obsessed with comedy and 
I think they let him on once on a Wednesday night when it was a small audience because technically I think you had to be at least 16 to be there. But, yeah, I don't know if it was Simon Enstall or Enstis, uh, Enstall. I can't remember. But anyway, this is a story about Roger Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield, not Roger. Rodney Dangerfield. He got his success when he was older. Because he started out as a comedian. They used to call him like hack comedians. So he was... Um, is, there's a lot of comedians that are very similar back in the 50s and the 60s in America where they'd all like wear suits and have the same kind of hairstyles, haircuts. If you look at Lenny Bruce, look at the... Um, he wasn't a hack, but I'm just saying they all kind of had the same sort of style. Even if they were being irreverent on stage, they'd all be dressed nicely. Uh, George Carlin was like that before he became a hippie. Um, Richard Pryor was basically one of his famous sayings, or a saying he said is he earned a really good living being uh, Bill Cosby for a few years. He was on TV and he, he did really well. But it was basically just a, a carbon copy of Bill Cosby because what a, a lot some people listening to this might not realise, forgetting any controversial stuff regarding the man, Bill Cosby was a superstar. Uh, and I don't mean like, oh, we remember, I remember he was on TV course he was everyone no I don't mean that as a comedian long before television his television shows he was in America he was the top comedian he was filling out stadiums in America with his stand-up shows he had albums number one albums in the charts with his comedy albums he was biggest comedian I say biggest I mean maybe Jerry Lewis was I can't imagine many people were more famous than Jerry Lewis in the 60s but Bill Cosby like maybe in the 70s maybe that was his period Steve Martin was also huge as well but anyway Rodney Dangerfield he, there used to be all these um, like these cafes in the 50s and the 60s where people used to go along and they'd just try and earn a living uh, clip joints and stuff like that whatever that means and to try and get a bit of money and it'd just be you know it was kind of um, yeah it, was, it sounds romantic when I read about it but it probably wasn't but it still sounds like it'd be a lot of fun you know everyone was just trying to get enough money to eat basically so he he did do very well he, he he went at it for ages and ages and ages and didn't do very well and then he then he started doing well I'm not sure if he went away and came back and he started doing okay and then he got a, a slot on the Ed Sullivan show and he did something that Ed Sullivan didn't like and he basically got blackballed or blacklisted or cancelled or whatever before he even got going and it set him back years and then he came back when he was older and he became a big star but he didn't you know he I've seen I've seen him on TV like old clips from the 60s, I think. Maybe 70s. But let's have a look. Let's see if what I'm saying is correct. Because I've not looked at it. So Rodney Dangerfield. I've just tested my, my memory, really. Rodney Dangerfield. Born 1921. Wow. 20 years ago he passed away. Blimey. 
So 21, 31, 41, 50. Yeah, so he's, he, he very much could have been around. Um, let's have a look. Oh, come on. Uh, come on. Where are you? Why is it not showing me Rodney Dangerfield? Here we go. His name was Jacob Cohen. Jack Roy. Born Jacob, but then he changed it. Rodney Dangerfield. Stand-up comedian. So, born 1922. He began his career work. This is uh, Wikipedia, by the way. He began his career working as a stand-up comedy comic at the Fantasy Lounge in New York City. Let's see, this is just absolutely rough. They're not. They're completely missing out a huge bit. Maybe they're just saying nice things because he's passed away, possibly. And I'm not saying anything nasty anyway. I'm just saying, just telling the story because it's interesting what happened. His act grew in popularity as he became a mainstay in late night talk shows throughout the 60s and 70s, eventually developing into a headline act on the Las Vegas casino circuit. He appeared in a few bit parts in films such as The Projectionist throughout the 70s, but his breakthrough film roles came in 1980 like Caddyshack and things like that, back to school, career. So his career, at the age of 15, he began to write for stand-up comedians while performing the uh, former... Uh, right, at the age of 19, he legally changed his name to Jack Roy. That's the name he used to perform on stage with, I think. He struggled financially for nine years, at one point performing as, performing as a singer-waiter until he was fired before taking a job selling aluminium siding in the mid-50s to support his wife and family. He later quipped that he was so little known that he gave up show business. So business. He was... <laughs> I remember this, it's a funny line. He later quipped that he was so little known that when he gave up show business, he was the only one who knew he'd quit. I was the only one who knew I'd quit. That's funny. It was a bit like me when I quit. No one knew. No one even knows. In the early 60s, he started reviving his career as an entertainer. So I was correct. He, he quit. But that was... Um, it wasn't going well. So it, like he did it for nine years. Struggled for nine years. And then he quit and he went to... Basically... Got a job as a salesman I imagine he was very good at it as well uh, and then he started then he went back in the early 60s continued as a salesman but did performing in the evenings uh, finding a little bit of success fell into debt around 20,000 by his, his own estimate and couldn't get booked he later, he later joked I played one club it was so far out my act was reviewed in Field and Stream don't know what, I think it's a magazine, oops. Dangerfield came to realise that what he lacked was an image, a well-defined on-stage persona that audiences would relate to, one that would distinguish him from other comics. After being shunned by some premier comedy venues, he returned, returned home where he began developing a character for whom nothing goes right. So he took the name Rodney Dangerfield from an episode of Jack Benny on his radio program. Okay. The name resurfaced again in December 1940. Okay, so... Dangerfield reached national prominence appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show in March 1967. Seven. See, this is it. The Ed Sullivan Show, 1967. Now, I'm pretty sure he had issues there. And then he says, soon began headlining shows in Las Vegas and continued making frequent appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show. So it couldn't have been the Ed Sullivan Show. It must have been a different show. Steve Allen, maybe? Right, okay. So 
I'm going to have a look. Rodney Dangerfield. Steve Allen Show. Let's have a look. Allen. Let's say uh, place Rodney Dangerfield, Steve Allen Show. Why did okay? Why did Steve Allen leave at Wutico? Uh, okay, right. So there's going to be so Steve Allen. Okay, what I'm going to do? Dodden, Rodney Dangerfield. Blackboard. Why Rodney Dangerfield was banned from? I'll turn his volume down so it doesn't disturb me. Okay. Why Rodney Dangerfield was banned from the Johnny Carson show? And how they made up. So Rodney Dangerfield was one of Johnny Carson's most popular guests in the seventies and eighties. It was his performances of Carson that led to his getting a lead role in Caddyshack. Things weren't always so rosy. Um, with Carson refusing to have Dangerfield on his show early on. Um, right, there was more. There was it was different. It was more. There's more. There's more. Okay, let's have a look. Place. Oh, Ronnie Dangerfield. Blacklisted. Comedian True Stone. America said, okay, I can't find it. I read it. I read it in a book, so it doesn't mean it's true, does it, I guess? Huh. So it's saying why Roddy Dangerfield was banned from the Johnny Carson show. See, I remember it was something about he made a finger signal or a hand signal that the host didn't like. My memory was that it actually put him back, put his career back, but from Wikipedia it didn't, so I don't know. But he definitely was successful, but it took a long time. He didn't quit, kept going. That's where I went wrong, man. Let me think about it. He started doing well in the 70s. He was born in 1921. So he was in his 50s before he started gaining any kind of success. So he was around my age, probably. And what was he when he... Eh, 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 eh. He was 82. Um, so, 56, 78. So he had, he had like 30 years of fame. 30 years of success, let's say. I mean, he was already successful because he was, I reckon he was very successful at sales. Imagine what, how good he would have been. Every, you know, people would probably look forward to him turning up to take their order because, or to sell them something because he was just, funny I reckon he was enjoyable person to be around maybe I don't know yeah. where did I get talking oh I've got my book I've got my book so I mentioned this yesterday an introduction to childhood and youth studies and psychology so this is the Open University book. 
I need better lighting though because I can't I don't know I'm still trying to look at it and I can't read it in this light yeah can't read it in this light don't worry I'm not going to start talking about getting glasses again although I do need to get some glasses some new glasses what I want to do what I need to do is start trying to find resources online you know, basically looking at the book I already tried I started this today actually but looking at the at the chapters so the first chapter is called what is childhood and youth studies so that's like the first introduction and then the second chapter is the psychology of childhood and youth number three chapter three is children's bodies Chapter 4 is Making Sense of the Self. Chapter 5 is Diverse Families. Chapter 6 is Young People's Mental Health. Chapter 7 is Education, Schools and Learning. Chapter 8 is Models of Disability and Their Effects on Children's Lives. Chapter 9 racism and ethnicity ethnicity 10 global childhoods 11 gender in childhood and youth 12 child digital childhood and youth life with screens i don't know what that means oh yes screens i guess computer screens 13 or telephone screens Adolescents, teenagers and youth, a time of change. And lastly, chapter 14, transitions to adulthood. So this book, as far as I'm aware, covers everything that I'm going to be studying over the next year, between October and I guess the end of the academic year, which is probably June, I suppose, May, June maybe July, probably June, or July, one of them. So, I'd like to try and see if there's any audio resources that I can listen to. Uh, lectures and stuff like that on the individual topics that are covered in the book uh, or on the course, and I suppose the best thing to do is just go onto the Open University website and see what they suggest. But I do quite enjoy listening to audiobooks. Okay, I like the idea that it's going to sink in, you know, if I keep listening to the same material, keep listening to the same book, uh, then it will, the information, the knowledge will sort of stay inside my memory and you know my main goal for this not just this year for the end of this uh, academic year but also for the end of the whole degree is to get a first I need to get a first a degree like a first mark I mean like top mark I don't know if first is the top or is it I think it is so that's what I need to do maybe they do a distinction I don't know but I want to get I need to get first I need to get top mark that's just something that has to happen it has to happen man it's just my plan that's why I'm doing it not the only reason I'm doing it but it is a reason because I wasn't able to achieve that last time and I could have done had I done things a bit different? Had I been on medication, probably, to be honest. Had I known. Had I known what I knew now. So, yeah. Um, so, that's something that's coming up. We're moving towards it. It's... Uh, blime, it's amazing. It's nearly here. October's nearly here. 
it's just, I mean, what is it, the 4th or 5th of September already? Like, wow. So, yep. And that's it, really. Finley's now fast asleep to the side of me. Didn't even realise he was there. <laughs> I don't know when he climbed up. I, I stroke him, but I don't realise I'm stroking him. I just... I guess I'm just used to him being around, so I don't really notice him. So I don't know how long I've been talking. Probably doesn't seem like very long at all, really. But I'm going to go and... <sighs> so now three minutes past seven. I don't know what time it was when I started this probably six o'clock maybe so I'm gonna go now and tomorrow is Q&A Friday so you know how focused I am on those days oh yeah never get distracted me never 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 get distracted N uh -oh. so Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself. Remember to be gentle with yourself because you do deserve to be happy. Lots of love.